Your Royal Highness. <laughs> Sarah Shackley is the Deputy um, Chief of Staff, and Nicole uh, Gallatin as uh, Henry, opposite for Taylor. Uh, Sarah, there was a big bidding war for this book um, four years ago, and you, uh, you and Rick Berlanti, the other producer, went and made me part. Why did you think that it would be a great movie? I mean, Casey's <coughs> book was just such a delight, and you know, this was. So I think, you know, that orange guy was still president, and it was pretty dark. It was a dark time in our nation's history, and this book delivered a real kind of just sunshine and light and love and humor, and it just made you feel good. And, you know, what, what they wrote was unbelievably charming, and I think the world needed more charm. And so uh, Alex and Henry were just so well drawn, and the book was so delightful. We, it was before it was published. So, you know, we met Casey. Uh, they were living in Colorado at the time. And it was. And Amazon was incredible. Uh, Jen Saki and her whole team stepped up in such a massive way. And they always treated this book like a really big deal, a really big book that needed to be a really big movie. And I, I just want Jen to get all the credit in the world for that. Because that's not, everyone doesn't think that way. And, and um, she really saw the potential in the book. So we were just very lucky to get it. We were very passionate. Um, our executive, Mike McGrath, was the first to read it. And he was like, I'm almost embarrassed to talk to you about it because it's pretty sexy. And I was like, I don't know how to tell you the plot exactly. And I was like, let's just watch that for a time. And then I read it, and we all flipped out for it. And so great. So we were just very lucky. And the chemistry, as we saw on the screen, between um, Alex and Henry, actually, between uh, Nichols and uh, Taylor is what made this work. How did you um, mix them and match them? Who got cast first? Uh, Nick was cast first, and um, it was it was always about the chemistry, and it was always trying to find, like, finding Taylor was later in the process, um, and we were so lucky and relieved, honestly, and it was so clear. But it was during COVID, so we had to do chem reads and auditions always on Zoom. So you didn't, there was a, there wasn't really a sense, we didn't know for sure until we got to rehearsals and you guys both got to London and, and but you could, they were both, honestly, they're both individually so charming, especially Taylor. <laughs> because he's here. And, um, Whoa. <laughs> and so it wasn't, it wasn't hard to imagine that these two actors would be great together and they're both such kind human beings. How, how was that Zoom uh, test? <laughs> did you um, did you kind of know when you did that Zoom test um, with Nicole? Zoom is tough. You know, I think after that, um, after COVID, when we or during COVID, when we had to audition kind of in a vacuum and just send it off, and then every chem test we had was on Zoom. It's really you just really have to find something about your acting partner that connects you because you're staring at a screen. And you're really not connecting like we're connecting right now, eye to eye, truly. You know, he has a screen, I have a screen, and then there's miles and miles between us. And so I came from the East Coast on a flight, and like, hey, we'd like to do a camera with you on Monday. I said, okay, I'm at a wedding right now. I'll be home Monday morning. Like, okay, 1 p.m. So I got off the flight, went to my sister's apartment, set up on her kitchen counter, and was like, all right, go time. We just made it happen. What scene was that that you read? Oh, just a lot. We did the, uh, I don't know. Did I pause it? No, it was the I Flew Across an Acting Ocean. That one. That big scene, the big fight. And then there was one more that I can't think of. Actually, that's a good, very good segue um, because we were going to be talking about your, the big moments of your character. It's, uh, Henry kicks things off um, with the surprise kiss of New Year's, but um, it is your character, Alex, who does the heavy lifting in that relationship and flies across the ocean and walks in the rain and gives that impassioned speech. Um, did you use any romantic movie references? Because uh, that white shirt with is like had a lot of <laughs> Mr. Darcy vibes. Yes. <laughs> It did feel very Mr. Darcy, it felt a little uh, Ryan Gosling in the notebook. And it definitely watched some old school. I mean, 10 Things I Hate About You, I think, in that realm of, um, of films, that 
those kind of things that I, I mean, like what you watch growing up, and you're like, I want to make that feeling for this film. And what about there was another big, uh, the political speech. Um, it's not political, he addressed the topic addressed when you, the relationship is discovered by a scheming reporter, like I want to apologize for the journalist everywhere. Um, that it was a very strong um, speech and it's felt like it could be given by a politician. I, I know you dabbled into political science, but uh, did you did you model it after, did you watch a lot of speeches uh, by real politicians? Yeah, that's, it was so tough because sometimes when you watch politicians, they get into their cadence, right? But I feel like Barack Obama was the best um, at giving speeches. And so I watched a lot of President Obama because he was Woo! so um, kind of versatile when he spoke and always kept my attention. And so I was trying to channel that. But then sometimes it'd be like, you're in a rhythm, get out of the rhythm. You know, it, because it's daunting sometimes when you're, you're, you're like addressing the nation, but then you also have a group of, like the crew is just staring at you like on their phone, you know, like scrolling and stuff. And then you're like, and world peace. You know, and so it, it was tough, but yes, I kept involved in that. Right when the expert out with the menu for lunch. <laughs> People had two values. But also, by the way, in defense of reporters, we also had some friends who, uh, political reporters, who helped make sure that we had uh, as much authenticity as we could in, uh, in those areas. And Matthew Lopez, who comes from the theater, loves a monologue. So. He loves a monologue. Yeah. Um, and before this move, between the, those four years uh, between getting the book and making the movie, there were a few romantic movies um, with uh, gay characters that didn't do quite well as people hoped. Did you have any trepidations and why do you think this one crossed over in such a huge way that we get like by now probably 200 million TikToks? I, um, I don't know. Yeah, that's, that's all about TikTok. Okay. Um, it's, uh, I don't know and I, you know, I think I, one of my first bosses was a man named Alan Horn and he would always talk about how at a certain point you just have to turn the movie over to the movie gods. And sometimes the movie gods smile and sometimes they don't. So I don't know, I wish everyone success and I wish everyone well. But for us, I think there was a just, there was a, and this is not, I'm not like subtextually subtweeting any other movie. I, you know, I have friends involved, I think in some of the movies you're referencing, but like, we just, there's such joy in what Casey wrote. And I think that was what was most important for us to capture. And I think that, and I know how deeply Nick and Taylor felt a responsibility to the fans of the book and to Casey, you know? And I think that really informed everything that we did was really trying to make it for an audience we knew like wanted to love it. So it's, that's a different kind of pressure than telling an audience they should love something. Um, but we were just so grateful. But that was really, that was always the, the, the guiding principle was the fans. What was the pressure on you um, doing that and getting that relationship on screen and, and Alex? And what was your thoughts that they received? Oh, God. <laughs> I think through the years, I received a lot of um, just queer scripts that I was never like, wow, this is such a universal love story that everybody will enjoy. And after reading, the book and the script, I said, oh wow, like, this is a change maker. I think this is something that anyone, um, you know, young to older can truly just enjoy it. And what did you just say? What was your favorite scene? <laughs> what was your favorite scene? My favorite scene, I mean, the, the cake scene is incredible. And I really like the, you know, I flew across the African Ocean for you. Like that was something that we were working up to. Um, and it just felt like a big responsibility for us to get it right, and I hope we did. I mean, it seems like the re reactions are showing that we did. Um, yeah. And Woo! Just, yeah. Woo! You're like fishing. You're fishing. Okay. Come on. <laughs> um, and I think Nick and I, from the beginning, were in lockstep. Like, this means so much to more than just us and more to Casey, and it represents you where we can be one day. And you know, we really wanted to. It was just, it's a great, what's great about it as a romantic comedy is, you know, for me, I love a room, I love a good, we all wanna feel good and like feel like love wins. And but which, a lot of romantic comedies have been made. And so there's 
to be a little bit of a familiarity in the beats. And this felt, the stakes for this, the obstacles felt so real. Um, and so universal in terms of anyone could understand why it would be hard for these two people to be together. And so I think that was part of like the joy and fun of the movie and why it's universal. I figured you're not going to mention the kick scene as your favorite. How long did it take to get all that stuff out of your favorite everywhere? We smelled like sweet cream for probably three days, <laughs> both of us. I, I mean, I think he found some in his ear like two days later. <laughs> I was like, Vic, you got to clean your ears back. But I, was like, I mean, it was, it was from some stupid stuff. Uh, but it was a great time. We had two days, and we were with the city of London at this incredible Goldsmith. Goldsmith. It was called Goldsmiths. And we were You've seen it on the crown. Yes, I mean, you yeah, have the crown. It's a template, man. Show, show. Uh, it, it was a great scene. And uh, I know a lot has been asked about uh, sequels. Uh, if, if, is it all hinging on uh, Casey writing another book, or can you do a sequel? I mean, I personally would like to see one where um, Alex is a, a wingman to Nora after she was so helpful to him as she is looking for love for herself. We, we love Nora. Uh, I think Nora is starring in a giant HBO show. Uh, yeah. So, you know, look, I think everyone wants another party when a party's good. So I was like, no, it's good. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> but uh, do we know anything about a, another book? Or they don't know anything? Well, I know Casey, and I think Casey, they would appreciate me mentioning this. Casey has a new book coming up that is not a sequel that they're very proud of. Um, so I, they're. Everyone's busy, every, you know, but this is, the, the fans obviously are really important to everyone, and certainly Casey has such a deep connection with their fans. Um, and so, but their latest book is not a sequel. And it is well known. <laughs> On their Instagram. That's how I know. Okay, and it's an election year, so I have to ask this. Um, in, the, in the movie, just a quick reminder, um, we had a Democratic president played by um, Uma Thurman as the first female president of the United States. And uh, Alex uh, helped flip Texas, and that was the key to winning re election. So, what do you think we'll see first in our lifetime? An openly gay British prince or Texas going blue again? <laughs> That's an excellent, excellent question. <laughs> Thank you so much.